Here we are in Liverpool. Welcome to Question Time. Good evening. Welcome to our audience here who will be putting the questions and to our panel who, I swear to God, do not know what the questions are until they're asked them by the panel, by the audience, despite what people say. Um, our panel is the Conservative Education Minister Liz Truss, Labour's Shadow Energy Secretary Caroline Flint, the President of the Liberal Democrats Tim Farron, the Mail on Sunday columnist Peter Hitchens, and the author of the book Chavs, Owen Jones. Now, we'll take our first question from Joy Boyd, please. Should the government introduce a windfall tax, ditch green levies, or should we just wear more jumpers? Should we just wear more jumpers? Well, this is the third time we've discussed this, and it comes up all the time because the picture keeps changing. Um, Peter Hitchens. Uh, none of those things. What the government should do is abandon the ridiculous drive towards green energy which is the main part of this price increase which we can control. We can't control the world price of energy, but we can get rid of this crazy system of milking the public to subsidise landowners and others to build useless windmills, which most of the time don't produce any power anyway, and which are only there to serve a mistaken dogma about man-made global warming. How much could you bring down the price of energy? If you had your way, how much would it bring the well, price I think down? It, one of the things, I couldn't, I couldn't give you an exact figure, but I think probably, a, a, quite, a, probably I would guess, 50 or 60 pounds uh, out of, of an average bill would come off as a result of those things. But what is much more important is far more will come off because all these green levies and, and things like the carbon floor tax are due to hit even more heavily on the public in the next few years than they are now. That part of your electricity and gas bill is due to go up. And at the same time, this country is risking serious energy problems because here we are, a country sitting on huge piles of coal which refuses to burn it on the grounds that it will create, it will create global warming. Well, China, for instance, builds another couple of coal-fired power stations every month. Do you think we should it's, reopen coal mining? I think we probably should. If it, it, is, it is the cheapest form of energy. It's one we produce ourselves. It's absolutely absurd to deprive ourselves of, and as, as we're doing at the moment, we have shut down and are in the course of shutting down more perfectly, perfectly efficient coal-fired power stations in right. this country, not because they don't work, but because of European Union regulations which force us to do this crazy thing. Okay. Tim Farron. Well, I mean, politicians who talk about putting an extra jumper on are politicians who've never known what it's like to have to work hard to get next week's rent and to pay the bills, and so that's an outrageous suggestion to make. Uh, when it comes to the green levies, it's really important to remember what they actually pay for. They pay for the two million lowest income households to have 135 quid off their energy bills. They pay for the insulation. Well, those aren't green levies, they, those are redistribution. It's absolutely, but well, it's why about... Why do you call them green levies? But, levies? It's a, but it comes green. under that it also includes the money that we give to elderly people to insulate their homes. So that's not what they're green. talking about. That's and, what... it, and it's fair. Yeah. And the element of the green levies that people talk about you know, it's not about windmills, it's about making it sure that people in this city have jobs in green manufacturing. If we're concerned about our children today, we're going to be concerned about, concerned about our children tomorrow and in the future as well. Climate change is absolutely ha happening. It is the single biggest threat that this, this country faces in the decades to come. And if we don't face up to it, then our legacy will be trashed. So what's by the your policy for the general complaint and, that prices and, have gone up by 8 to 10 percent? We have the weakest and most useless of all the regulators looking, right. after, looking after our energy sector. Ofgem is pathetic in the extreme. Off what? The water regulator is able to prevent water companies putting up their prices more than once every five years. Recently, Thames Water tried to put theirs up by 8% and were stopped by Off what? If you've got a watchdog like uh, Ofgem that has got no tooth, no bite and no bark, you put that flaming watchdog down and you replace it with one right. that can genuinely cut prices. Okay. <laughs> Liz Truss. Well, I grew up in a house where my dad was constantly telling me to put a jumper on and turning the heating off. And once the pipes froze because it was so cold and we got flooded. So, you know, there is a limit to what you can do with a jumper. And do we do need... more should be done with jumpers need, there? Well, I'm just saying there is a limit and we do need yeah, Obviously there's a limit, but do you think people energy. should take the advice of wearing an extra jumper, like Number 10 said at one point last week? Well... 
I, I don't think it's about jumpers. This is about how expensive energy is and the fact that gas prices doubled under the previous government because we didn't see investment in new power sources. And we've just signed a deal on Hinkley Point, which will mean that there is new energy coming forward in 2023. Nuclear. But we've had years and years of a lack of investment, a lack of a clear energy strategy. And yes, you know, coal is important in the short term. We also need to get gas going. We need to make sure we've got shale gas being exploited in this country, which will benefit local communities. We also need to look at liquid. We also need to look at liquid natural gas. And one of my previous jobs was working in liquid natural gas shipping, where you can sign in long-term contracts. But we do need to look at the green taxes to be able to do that, because at the moment they are incentivising particular forms of energy that are extremely expensive. But and that's moment, why the yeah, government... Moment, you're, you're talking about but gas. We've already, moment, we've already point, reduced... Point, you're, you're talking about gas. No, no one's taking up this point about the green levels because they, they, they're all... I'm just about to say it before you interrupted it. me. Well, the point about the gas is we have to import increasing amounts of it because we no longer make our own. Mm -hmm. And we have to import it to run power stations to provide power for the enormous amounts of time when the windmills don't work because, okay. have I, you guessed it, the yeah, wind is not blowing. OK, all right. What's your point about rolling back the green taxes that the Prime Minister said he was going to well, do. What would you like to see happen? Well, I would like to see that because I think it's wrong that we're implementing green taxes faster than other countries. We may be potentially exporting jobs out of our country you because decided energy to do it, didn't you? is so expensive. These policies were put in place by Ed Miliband. These policies were put in place by Ed Miliband. You voted for them. Nonsense. You, 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 you voted for them all. These, you, the, you, these policies were put in place. Not everybody at once. The Just Prime Minister it. has said that he well. wants to review them because he now feels that we are moving faster than other countries <laughs> and it's potentially damaging to our economy. It's absolutely not. It's absolutely sensible economics when people are facing high costs of energy prices. We're taking the action that Labour didn't take a, a nuclear power station has not been built since 1995. We all knew these problems were in the pipeline for years and years. Labour did nothing to put the new energy supplies in place. They did nothing to do any nuclear power, which is a renewable source. This, Gas well, has half the emissions of coal to be able to still hit our carbon targets. But I think there are better ways to hit the green targets, which are important. Which are what? Deliver, well, investing in nuclear investing in shale gas will help us achieve those targets. Okay. Matt um, Perhaps the public would be more supportive of green taxes if we knew that that would then generate more jobs in the future. I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I agree all with right. that. Caroline Finn. Well, um, first of all, to Joy, what we've witnessed in the last 24 hours is David Cameron once again making up policy on the hoof. He's in a panic. He is uh, clearly sensing there is a huge public discontent with the way their bills are rising uh, in the last few weeks, but also the last three years. We've seen £300 go on bills. And you know what, Liz, actually, the House of Commons Library has confirmed that bills are going up three times faster they since the general under election. Labor. Three they times faster under since government. the general election government. under this government. And let me be clear about something. What we are witnessing here is a Prime Minister who is using green levies, and of course we've got to have value for money, and of course we should get jobs out of it, but he's using these green levies as an excuse for not standing up to these energy companies and the way they operate. He hasn't got the bottle to do that. Can I just make a point? Can I just make a point? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He says your policies are a contract, that you can't do it. Well, he, he's flapping around because he hasn't got any. Let me be clear about what our policies are. Is it a contract are. or not? It is not a contract. What we said is... When we have looked at wholesale prices, not the green levies, but the wholesale prices, Peter, we looked at 2009. Wholesale prices dropped by 46%. We never saw that reflected in a reduction in our bills. And why is that? Because we have ended up, after decades since privatisation, with six companies dominating 98% yeah. of the market. And when did that happen? They create energy, sell it to themselves, on to sell it onto us. And the reason why they reduced was that John Major took away the restriction on separating generation from supply, which led to the yep. big six we've right. got today. Right. And something needs to be done about that. And, and Cameron is just not up to it. Okay. That's I, why we that, said right. we're a Can I, The number yes. of... Just, just on this point... A briefer, a briefer the answer. number of like companies it. dropped from 14 to 6 under Labour. Because John they Major... They didn't interrupt, no, please. They, let, they, let people have they a say. They fell from 14 to 6 
under Labour. What did Labour do to get high quality, low cost energy into our country? They say that we needed nuclear power stations. They didn't build anything. They didn't do anything to promote competition in the gas and you energy can. markets, which we're now doing. Why did the number That's of companies true. fall? And now we've got seven new new entrants into the energy market in the right. last no, no, two don't, years. Don't interrupt, Shella. Your, 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 your legacy, Caroline. It's not your legacy. Caroline, just wait a okay. minute. Let's hear from Owen Jones and then one or two members of the audience. You hold the point you want to Thank you. counter and I'll let you do it. Well, I find this new Tory war on green levies fascinating. Do you remember David Cameron poncing around the Arctic, hogging huskies? Do you remember vote, vote blue, uh, go green? Do you remember the, the Tory party that changed their logo to a tree and now they're waging all-out war against these environmental levies and the green jobs of the future? But just in terms of the first question, I think it's a really important question about how we deal with this crisis, and it is a crisis. I think it's fascinating because we heard this swivel-eyed uh, talk, kind of neo-McCarthyite talk of socialism and Marxism because of a temporary price freeze, when actually, if you look at the polling, as far as the British people were concerned, what Ed Miliband was proposing was too moderate, because nearly 7 out of 10 want our energy supply back under the control of the British people in public ownership. And I'll tell you why that's so quickly. <laughs> I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why that's the road we have to go down. Last year, the big six made £3.7 billion worth of profit. They're now hiking up their prices by, what, 10%. They're going to drive 9 million people into fuel poverty. That will be people lying awake at night, panicking about choosing between heating their homes and feeding their kids. And this is not hyperbole. People will die because of these price rises. Already, 20,000 elderly people die in excess winter deaths. Excess winter deaths, a horrible, macabre phrase. According to Age UK, you are three times more likely to die of preventable death in a cold home as a warm home. Right, well, For uh, that uh, reason, uh, they uh, have forfeited why would, their right why would to control energy supply. Why would nationalisation? You've heard all the, all the discussion about shortages <laughs> of fuel and all the rest of it. Why would nationalisation make any difference? Because what would happen then is instead of lining the profits of greedy shareholders and CEOs, the likes of whom, for example, are now building a £2 million mansion using money squeezed from the bills of pensioners, freezing literally, in some cases, to death in their homes. £2 million is we not going to go very that. far in providing We can invest for that in actually, people, people, actually saving lives and actually having energy prices which people out there right. can afford. The, the gentleman there has had his hand up for some time on the left of the audience there, you, sir. It's, I mean, it's, it's true that, um, that the deal at Hinkley is, is brilliant for British jobs and British business, um, but it, it just astounds me that given the comments the panel have made tonight, uh, why the government haven't looked at the consumer side of the deal in as much depth as the, as the other economics within the deal. You mean you think the pricing of, the, of what, what the Hinkley's right. going to provide has not mm. been thought about? That's, that's, well, not as in-depth as, as possibly the, the job creation issue. Uh, OK, mm. and over mm. there, in the, in the, with the person with spectacles there, yes. Um, why don't we just get rid of the green levy tax and put more money into nuclear and coal because you're going to get far more jobs out of coal-fired power stations and nuclear power stations than you are going to get out of windmills, in a Not way. Not in Germany. Oh, right. In Germany, they've created hundreds of thousands of renewable energy jobs. Those are the jobs yeah, of the yeah. future, green jobs. Okay. Caroline Flint, I said I'd bring well, you in. Can you answer his point yeah, well, in okay. your way? Yeah, then, I mean, just then. as Owen was saying there, in Germany, two-thirds of uh, uh, energy generated, which is solar and wind, uh, is actually coming from individuals and community-based organisations. And the truth is, we're apparently the windiest country in Europe. And it's not just about onshore, it's about offshore. And when I look at the places around our coastline that are looking to use offshore wind, as a way of getting jobs and skills. It's an important part of the mix. Now, we need a mix, and I believe nuclear is yep. part of that. I have to say, when we were discussing nuclear under the Labour government, David Cameron said it should be a last resort, and the Liberal Democrats were against using nuclear power. So they've come on a bit since then. We doubled renewable energy under the last government, and we need to do more. But investment yep. in renewable has halved in the last three All years. Right. It's about the mix, and it's about where we need to be in terms of being ahead of the curve on jobs, but also cleaner, cheaper energy in the long run let's, and let's, come, like let's come back to the current problem and the winter ahead this this this, this point about nuclear power caroline's saying she's in favor of it why did labor do nothing when they were in government we've signed a deal which we, is more affordable we set it in the electricity for the deal price to be signed. the electricity price uh, is on. more affordable let's talk about than wind no, no, power said, based on an offshore about the winter ahead and what's going to happen and what your mm. party is going to do to help people who are in difficulty as john major put it 
we're going to choose between heat and eat, heating and eating. What's your gut party going to do about it? Well, we have a cold, yeah, cold, cold winter payment. We have the That's winter, place, winter fuel allowance. But, but all these policies that were suddenly announced in the House of Commons on Wednesday, are they going to take effect immediately, quickly? Are, they going to, are people going to see a reduction? Well, I think, it's, I think it's very important that we do support families struggling to heat their homes. How? And we How? do How? find solutions. What are you going to do well, for those elderly all, people freezing in their homes? First of all, we're enabling people to get cheaper energy bills by asking companies to make sure people are on the lowest tariffs, which But if is everybody's important. putting up their prices, we're what's introducing, the point of that? Well, not everybody is, and people are already switching. Four out of six to seven. cheaper, Liz, you've to cheaper the money companies. that was going to the fuel poor. The eco, the energy company obligation. I think it's an absolute cheek for, when you did nothing in office to create the supply that, that we need to go for to affordable the fuel energy. Poor. The other two We're picking of it up the pieces of your to right. insulate their homes yeah. anyway. Yeah. It, 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 Watching the two political parties handling our energy industry is, is like watching a, a, a drunken man running about with a Ming vase. I, th these people have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> The two, the, the, the two political parties, the, the, the Tories by privatisation breaking up the, the Central Electricity Generating Board destroyed uh, what was probably the most advanced and skilled uh, centre of nuclear power uh, generation in the world uh, and threw it away. Uh, Labour finished the process off by selling Westinghouse so that uh, we now have to go and beg uh, the Chinese and the French to build nuclear power stations for us who, who pioneered pioneered civil nuclear power. It is so pathetic, it is almost beyond, uh, beyond grief to, to expect yeah. something like that. The, none, of them, none of them will be honest about the extent to which our policies are controlled by the European Union, which, as I say, is forcing us to close down perfectly serviceable coal-fired power stations, uh, which actually means that as the power fails, which it will do as a result of this, great parks full of diesel generators, which are terribly eco-friendly, will have to be brought in to, 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 to cover up the gaps. They don't know what they're doing. The question of this winter is, of course, important, but the real question is that from between now and 2020, these insane green levies will if push, you, will the, push the prices of... If you do, that's why we These insane green levies will push the prices of your gas and electricity up more and more and more, and these people won't even they talk about it and won't a, a, do anything about it. They are, all of, they, are, they are all of this not minute, as people, as people, as people right, will Tim, find out. They are all of them committed to this, to, to this right, green Peter, lunacy. It's about, I mean, Blame them, not me. It's basic economics of demand and supply. There is insufficient supply of energy. It's not because of green levies. Green levies is about making sure we guarantee the future for our children and our children's children. And by the way, if you want to talk and about children's the children's about children's children's children, correct? You're not, and, and, you're not and, answering the question. And, and, the, the, and the economic point: if you want to invest in green energy that will create real jobs in this city, 95% of the supply chain of tidal and hydro energy is completely and utterly British. Yeah. That's the way to create jobs. Tim, That's would you like to see? And, would you like to see this spending on green e energy come out of taxation? and therefore, by implication, the rich are paying more than the poorer. Well, uh, or are you happy to have it loaded onto the bills of everybody? Equally? I'm not dogmatic about it. It's just why not? We need, why aren't you dogmatic? Because why should, why should you be? I mean, the well, because it's a regressive tax. The, You're the, in favour of regressive tax. I'm not. The important thing is to be both progressive and green. If you can do both, then that's absolutely the right thing to do. But the critical thing looking at this winter is, people, is his life and death. Oh, and he's dead right. This, it will be life and death for many people. And we have to tackle supply. It means creating that more, uh, the more creation of energy from within these shores. But it also means making sure we regulate and regulate now because right. within the profit margins of the big six you, is the ability to cut you, bills for millions of people in this Tim, country. Tim, you know as well though, but of the bill, you know, of the sort of average dual fuel bill, about £1,300 a year, £50 of that is going to support the development of green renewable energies, £50. That's why we cannot let David Cameron off the hook by blaming these green levies well, when been... the bigger issue yeah. is tackling the energy companies. And we need reform of that market, and our policy is to get rid of the present regulator and establish a All tougher right. energy watch. I think, I think we've, co Cameron's we've covered, we've covered the point. Just when you have one or two members of the audience, then we'll go on. You say in the front here. Yes. Just uh, a point you'd like to make. We've heard in the news that uh, Ed Miliband wants to put a temporary freeze on bills and we've heard that John Ma Sir John Major wants to put a windfall tax. Right. But shouldn't we like maybe cap the increase the uh, energy companies proper regulation you can do maybe the re at the rate of that. inflation or something yeah, rather than could, eight, could, nine, yes. always put the interest of profit in front of the consumers. That's why we just can't allow the big six to keep strangling like this. Okay, it's blackmail yeah. effectively. Just before, we leave, just before we leave the point, Liz Trust, 
Is it in the power of, of, uh, of the control uh, uh, of Gem to say, you'll bring those prices down, as a matter of fact? Well, they could, we won't they could do that, and we did have RPX, RPI minus X regulation in the industry. The issue is that we don't control international gas and oil prices. Those go up and down, and Ed Miliband has admitted that his fairy godmother act no, wouldn't sorry. work no, no, if but, international no. prices went no, up. No, OK, but... So, no, so but the, the point things... is that if you cap prices and prices go up internationally, then you end up with the three-day week and the lights going off. Right. So what we need to do is in, in enable investment into our industry so and encourage investment. You, you didn't do the investment. You didn't do the investment, Caroline. And they have gone down. We believe a tough energy watchdog should have the power to ensure that the energy companies, not just the big six, pass those reductions on to consumers. Because we all, right. all know all right, when they all go right, up, they go up. Thank you very much. You can do that now. You can do that now. We thank, are you doing that now. thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll move on to another topic because that's the third time in four weeks we've discussed this and each time <coughs> brings out something new, but I don't want to stay on it for too long. Of course, if, uh, if you're listening at home and want to comment, I'm sure you may, may want to comment, you can text us or you can Twitter, uh, got both at your command. Our hashtag is BBCQT. You can follow us at BBC Question Time. Or you can text comments to 83981 and the red button will tell you what other people commenting are saying. Right, I want to take a question, please, from... Oh, uh, we'll take a question from Helen O'Brien, please. Is spying on our allies ever acceptable? This is in the light of uh, Angela Merkel's complaint to President Obama that she was being spied on. And uh, it turns out now that 35, I'm told, according to tomorrow's Guardian, 35 heads of state are being spied on by the Americans. Is it acceptable, Caroline Flint? No, I, I don't think it's acceptable to uh, use surveillance in a way which is spying on people who are our allies, who work with us through international organisations, both on defence and on other matters as well. I, I don't think it's acceptable. Why did Labour spy on the G20? participants then in the conference in 2009? Well, I, I'm just saying, I think where, unless there is a threat uh, to our security, I think you have to have a rationale for this. And I don't think sort of just fishing trips for spying in that way is the right thing to do. And our security services, let me say, do a fantastic job for us uh, in all sorts of ways to help keep us safe. But there have to be rules within that and how they operate. And next week, for the first time, uh, the heads of MI5, MI6 and GCHQ are going to give public evidence to the Intelligence Committee at the House of Commons. But there have to be rules around this. Um, and I think it's quite right that Angela Merkel is aggrieved at what she's found what out. What do you think they were trying to find out? That's a good question, because the whole rationale for spying, which I think lots of us, or security services, which few would quibble, is to protect our security, stop us being blown up on buses. I think last time I checked, Angela Merkel wasn't likely to exactly. sign up to international terrorism. Neither was, for example, the Mexican president, who was also apparently spied on, and apparently that was actually for industrial uh, espionage, effectively. It was the US spying on them for those reasons. I think there needs to be a wider debate about this, and actually I think it's welcomed the likes of Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, who I think are genuine American heroes. Because what they've done... What they've done is they've shone a light on the dark recesses of power, how extensive this spying is. They've revealed secrets like the fact, for example, some of the outrageous things that have happened in Iraq uh, because of the American occupation. The results, for example, of drone attacks in Pakistan, which are increasing the risk of terrorism, not reducing it. And instead, what we should be doing is instead of having this spying on, on allies, on ordinary people as well, who are law-abiding people going about their own business. We should make sure the security services are accountable, that they don't have this argument, they're protecting our liberty, therefore they can do exactly what oh. they want, and we actually have an accountable security service, and we actually have freedom of information to know exactly okay. the sorts of things they're doing in well, our we... All right, all right. Pete Hitchens. The question was, is this spying on our allies ever acceptable? Well, the first problem is that our allies today might be our enemies tomorrow, and also that people, people who appear to be our allies might be our rivals. I think you'll find that an awful lot of intelligence work is commercial mm. yeah. uh, and industrial, not military, 
And I think that that's where much of it is concentrated. If you don't want to, your country to have that kind of information, then, of course, you can take a moral decision and say we're not going to do it. But what do they want to know about Angela Merkel? I don't know what they want to know about Angela Merkel. What would you want to know about Angela Merkel? Actually, there's almost nothing I want to know about Angela <laughs> Merkel, except how on earth it was that her family came to move to East Germany, which has always puzzled me, but, um, when everybody else is trying to get out. But, but le le leaving that aside, only her, tapping her telephone is going to discover that. Um, I, I think it's much more worrying that not the, the politicians who ought, I think, reasonably to assume that somebody is probably trying to tap their telephones all the time anyway, mm. uh, not the politicians having their telephones tapped, but that ordinary uh, citizens are having their telephones tapped and their emails registered and read by people who have no business doing so. That does outrage me. OK. Man in the check shirt there. Now, when the journalists were found to have hacked into the phones of politicians like John Prescott, they were hung, drawn and quartered. Regulation was bandied round. Everybody went to town on them. I agree that what they did was completely wrong <clears throat> and it was overreaching to the nth degree. But why should we feel any different when politicians are the victims than when the general public are the victims and it's the politicians who are actually initiating it? Liz, do you think the politicians are initiating in the sense that he means agreeing to it? Planning? Well, well, in this country, any activity of that kind, surveillance activity, ultimately has to be signed off by the Foreign Secretary and the Home Secretary. And I think that's right, because it is, um, you know, a very important matter. So when we I mean, spied on the G20 participants, that had been agreed by Labour's Home Secretary? Well, that's certainly the case under our government, that it does have to have senior level sign-off within government. I mean, I think the difficulty here is we're dealing with a much more complex world than we were in the Cold War, where it was clear who the enemies were and where they were. Now we have terrorist networks embedded in our own country, embedded in other countries. It may be somebody who looks entirely innocent. And I'm very worried about the way that GCHQ operates being exposed in public so those terrorists find out about the, the nature of the surveillance that's going on. I mean, we, we now have a much more open world. Technology makes it much easier to share secrets. It's much easier to get those things out. And our law enforcement agencies do, I think, have to have the power to be able to deal with those threats as they arise. Otherwise, do, we will all they, be in serious danger. Do, do, they do, themselves any some service, of the things... do they do themselves any service by tapping... Look, I'm Merkel's absolutely not defending telephone. Angela Merkel's telephone being tapped. And right. I have to say, if anyone tapped the Your telephones telephone. at the Department of Education, they wouldn't find anything more interesting than what's in the new mass GCSE. State. These are not terrorists. Terrorism is being used as a pretext to do this. You're talking about the Brazilian Prime Minister, <laughs> the head of Germany, you know. I'm not, I'm not defending <coughs> heads of state's telephones being tapped. What I'm doing is responding to Owen's point about the secrets being put out in the public domain about how we find out about these activities. Okay, because fine. we are in serious danger from very worrying terrorist We're networks. We're also in danger of having our hard-won liberties and freedoms, which our ancestors fought for at great cost and sacrifice, being taken away from us using the pretest of terrorism. Yeah. We must not let that happen. The man, man in the red shirt there. And then I'll come to you. Man in the red shirt there. It's about time our government started standing up for the people of this country instead of banding and standing them backwards for the Americans all the time. Every time you listen to the government, you've got the same rubbish all the time. We need to start standing up to the Americans, start, like, fighting back, and stop cutting our armed forces as well. OK. And you, sir, yeah. To expand on what the gentleman said up there, I'm quite worried about how long until the EU countries start pointing the finger at us. It's been known for a while that GCHQ has a close working relationship with the NSA, so... We don't know how far they're going. I mean, it's in all likelihood this is happening. Tim Farron? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know why Angela Merkel uh, moved to East Germany. Maybe she's a, uh, another, her, an, another, 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 another former communist who moved to the right. It I don't was, know. It, um, but, it, but, the, 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 but the point is, this was not just intelligence gathering. This is tapping the phone of a friendly head of state. Now, let's just ignore for a moment, and I'll come to the civil liberties issue in a minute, how utterly stupid is that? And whatever gain the US thought they might get from this was always going to be completely outweighed by the damage it has done to the diplomatic 
diplomatic relations between two very, very important countries. The post-war effort through the European Union, through NATO, the United Nations, G8, G20 more recently, in bringing countries together, sharing interests to make sure that we don't go to war again, is undermined by stupid, reckless decisions like this. And it forms part of a culture that runs through certainly the US administration and has run through the administration before this one in this country, where we think people's civil liberties are not as important as whatever the agenda of the political leaders of the day happen to be. Okay. I'll, take, I'll take a couple more points and then we'll go to another question. The man in spectacles there. Oh, yeah. I think when you get into the realm of uh, spying, um, I think, I think we're fooling ourselves that we think this is the first time that allies have spied on allies. Yes. Mm. I'm pretty sure that the right. British spied on the Americans before they came into the Second World War. Uh, I can't quote anything or clarify that. But I just think once you get into the realms of sort of spying, well, yeah, um, it's just spies will be spies. And that is, not to, that is not to kind of give an excuse to them, but I'm just saying once you get into that, you know, they've got all this technology. I think they've been greedy. They're sport for choice. And they've tapped Angela Merkel's phone because they can simply. You know, okay. and this is going to fall, fall back on them. It's going to blow back on them. Uh. Okay. And the man in the check shirt there. With black uh, I think any time you sacrifice liberty for security, it's a recipe for disaster. Flat out. Any uh, time you sacrifice what? Sorry. Liberty for security. Yeah. And like the other people were saying, with the spying going on, it's just been going on for years, and it, the only difference is now that you're telling us about it. <laughs> okay. Good. Let's go on. Thank you very much. Uh, Vikas Pai, please. Question from Vikas Pai. He's a nuclear engineer, I think. Yeah. Mr. Pai. The question is, what is wrong in having unqualified teachers in free schools if they are qualified enough in the subject they teach? This is the, the, the row about free schools, which are pretty well the same as academy schools, uh, between, uh, actually between two sides of your party, it seems, because you all said it was a good idea to have free schools with unqualified teachers, and David Law said how brilliant the unqualified teachers were, and suddenly Nick Clegg's saying, oh no, they've all got to be qualified in future. What's wrong with having unqualified teachers if they're good enough at the subjects they teach? There's quite a lot wrong with it, actually. I, I agree with the uh, proposals and the policies of this government in terms of the uh, decision to give teachers and head teachers far more freedom and autonomy. That is absolutely right. And it's right to use experts in, in the classroom to bring them in. I mean, use Lord Sugar to talk about business on a one-off occasion. You know, for your PE lessons, bring in Luis Suarez. Just don't let him teach a course in citizenship. You know, I, and it's... And, and, uh, when, and I worked in higher education for 13 years years before I became an MP and so I don't want to uh, offend everybody I used to work with. One of the problems we've been moving away from in universities is that we had people with PhDs coming out of their ears who are complete experts, research leaders of the best kind, geniuses and some of them incapable of com communicating that genius to anybody else and it's no good being a brilliant expert if you can't teach. And, and what really, about if you're a brilliant really, expert and you can teach? Really, If you're a brilliant expert and you can teach, then don't undermine the teaching profession by not taking the qualification. I'm quite happy for people to be taken on by a free school or academy and without a qualification, so long as they learn and do it on the job. That is, I mean, what we need to remember is being an expert is a good thing, but being a qualified teacher is also an incredibly good thing. Our teachers are fantastic, they are trained, and we undermine the entire profession mm. and damage our children if we throw away the importance of having a qualified teacher in the So what, what's going on in your... What's, what's going on in your party? Because you signed up to this policy in part of the coalition. Then David Laws comes in as the schools minister and he says the exact opposite of what you've <laughs> just said. Now you as president say what you've just said. And uh, your leader says something else. I mean, what's going on? You seem to be all over the shop. I'm not, I'm not of the view that we are. I mean, David Laws defended uh, uh, the, 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 the free schools. You said and, there are plenty of teachers who may not have formal qualifications, but who do a superb job. And, and the exact the, opposite of what and you in, just And said. in a specific instance, and you can say you bring somebody into a class and use them as an expert, most of us on this panel you know have probably done that. You know that's not how it's done. Like no. You know but, it's not like but that. But my, my take is, and Nick Clegg's take, and it's been mm. repeated again today, is that you do not, you must not undermine the teaching profession. This is not about the ideology about whether it's right or wrong. This is about the experience of our children in our schools. Yeah, but which and Liberal Democrat do you children, listen to seems exactly. to be the problem. Children in our schools deserve to be taught by people okay. who know what they're doing and are capable of teaching. L L this trust. Well, you're, you're, the, you're the children's minister. I, th I, think, I think we have to look at why we're doing this. We've just had a report from the OECD which says we have some of the lowest rates of literacy and numeracy 
in our population compared to other countries. We need to make sure that our children get the skills they need at school so they can go and get good jobs. And we're not doing that at the moment. That's why we're raising standards in GCSEs. That's why we're changing the curriculum to make it more effective. And that's why we're enabling academies and free schools to have those freedoms so they can deliver. And all the evidence is they are delivering. Academies are performing better than equivalent maintained schools. Free schools are getting better Ofsted reports than other schools are. And it's because they have those freedoms that schools like independent schools, which of course the Deputy Prime Minister went to, have, that they're able to do that. They're able to bring in the experts, they're able to bring in the great physics teachers, the great engineers and the great artists. And ultimately, Ofsted goes and inspects those schools to make sure teaching is up to scratch. And if it's not, we haul them in pretty quickly. And we've also got the exam results to judge by how well those schools are doing. But we need to do something serious to reform education in this country because we know that education is vitally important for the economy, but we know that we're not getting enough talented people with the skills they need. All right. And one, and of the, one of the things that motivates me so much in this cause is I grew up in Leeds, I went to a comprehensive school, I like... Owen got into Oxford. But I was one of only a few children to be able to do that. Yes. And we need to make sure that we don't waste our talent. We've got so many talented young people and we're not giving them the education they deserve. And we do need radical and reform And unqualified the teachers is the way to do it. That was the question. Well, no, giving head teachers the power to hire the best possible person. Right. Whether they're a great teacher, a great All mathematician, right. Point is the way to do it. Uh, thank you. Uh, Owen Jones. We'll come back to Owen Jones. Uh, well, firstly, I don't, I don't want to be too brutal on the Liberal Democrats. They've done so many U-turns and policy shifts, Tim. I mean, you must be so dizzy, I'm surprised you can even walk, frankly. But I've, I've I mean, changed, in terms I've of, changed nothing. In terms of, well, I mean, <laughs> often you have the kind of, you know, rhetoric of, of Tony Benn and the voting record of George Osborne. But in terms of the actual specifics of the free schools, I think in terms of Finland, for example, they've got one of the best education systems in the whole world, and they train up their teachers to the best possible degree. There's a different the difference between knowing how to teach and being an expert in your particular field. What free schools are doing, in my view, and I'm a pr person like yourself, proudly comprehensively educated, my primary school was in the bottom 5% by results. I was the only boy to go to university. As far as I know more, ended up in prison. That wasn't because I was brighter. It's because I had odds stacked in my favour from day one. If you look at the gap in vocabulary at the age of five, yeah, between right. an affluent and a poor child, it's 18 months. If you look at the impact of diet, poor kids turning up hungry. If you look at the impact of housing and the stresses that has on education, mm. or poor health. These are the issues that are really driving divisions in our educational system, not the structure of schools. And free schools, frankly, on average, and we've seen in 2011, they're less likely to take in kids from free school meals. They're sucking resources from other schools. That's not yes, they are. And they're going in areas often where there's a surplus of places. Let's stop scapegoating comprehensive education for all the ills of society. Let's wage war on the causes of education inequality, not the symptoms. And let's build an educational system we can all be proud of. I want to go back to the question of Vikas Pai, who's got his hand up there. Mr Pai. Well, my thinking is, if you are yeah. passionate about science, passionate about mathematics, is, and you have a degree in, in mathematics and science to back it up, you mm -hmm. can teach. You can. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. I, I don't know what the evidence is that our current system of teacher training is particularly successful in training teachers. As far as I know, it was introduced in the days of Harold Wilson. And before then, we had rather effective state schools called grammar schools, uh, which have been subsequently abolished in an act of extraordinary spite. I think it's also true uh, that, the, uh, th that the independent schools do not have the requirement that the, st the most state schools have uh, to employ teachers who've gone through the, the, the ordinary teacher but training system. But it's different. Wait a minute, I have people no, from privileged, educated let, backgrounds. We I, don't I, start I, from I, the same place. And I, I'll, people. I'll, I'll, I'll carry on if I might. Um, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the fact that someone has a, a qualification doesn't necessarily make them a good teacher any more than anything else does. The, what makes them a good teacher is that ability to teach, the desire to teach, the desire to communicate, which some people have, some people don't, and that has to be sorted out actually in practice, as all of us found at school, with the teachers who inspired us and the teachers who didn't. What you really need to worry about, most of all, is making sure that those children who at the moment are denied access to good education because their parents aren't rich, 
have access to good education. And I think a lot of that good education will be provided by teachers who don't have formal teacher training qualifications. Free schools are a, are a stunt and a gimmick, as are academies. There's no proof that academies are any better than comprehensives. Free schools will never, ever change the lives of most people. What all the parties need to do is to admit that they made a catastrophic mistake in 1965 by abolishing selection by ability and bring it back. Those people who sit on this panel and say they went to comprehensive schools, I think will for the most part turn out not to have gone to normal comprehensive schools, but to the kind of comprehensive schools that only some people can go to. How is it that they go to them, generally because their parents lived in areas that other people couldn't afford to live in? That is selection by, that is selection by money. That is selection by money. And it is very, very unfair. And it's quite, it's, it's quite, it's, it's quite extraordinary that parties which claim to be in favour of, of improving the situation of the poor constantly refuse to reintroduce a system which selects by ability and which we have therefore fails. Peter, we have it in Kent and poorer kids are less likely to do well in Kent where selection is still okay, in place. I think so you're all right in Kent. Selection in Kent is completely distorted because it's so... I want to bring Caroline Flinton, she hasn't yet spoken on this, but just before we do, your comprehensive school in an air, prosperous middle class area? No, or I, grew up, I, grew, area? I grew up in K.O. Green in Stockport. My primary school was in the bottom 5%. My secondary school was above the national right. average. My sixth form was below the national average. And I, don't, I went to Ridge Daniel Sixth. All right, enough. I went Liz? to a whole tall comprehensive my, school. My, 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 the comprehensive I went to is an average comprehensive in Leeds. William Rowe, eh? I'm definitely. I mean, I, I checked once with a mate of mine, and uh, out of the people of my year, five went to prison, four went to university. Oh, right. Oh, right. Well, that was a good school then. That, that one going. We were, we were a bad year. My sisters were quite good. What the old boys <laughs> reunions say? Uh, Caroline Flint, you go to. I went to a comprehensive school in Twickenham in London. My children all went to comprehensive school in Doncaster. Twickenham is a, a middle class area, of course. Um, right? Yeah, it is a more middle class area, I suppose. Area, yes. But, you know, I'm not from a middle class family. It was a former grammar school. And what I would say is, whenever we have these conversations about how good the grammars were, only a few yeah. young people got the benefit. Secondary modern wrote off That's generations right. of young That's people right. and, and did nothing right. for Let's come to the free school. Come to the free school. There are there are 174 free schools. There are over 21,000 state schools. And the amount of time we're spending on free school schools seems completely a ridiculous amount of time for the government to do. And on the issue of unqualified teachers, look. Um, I know from my own children's education, we had sports people, we had other people come in who did master classes, who worked alongside the teachers. And we've always had that provision in the state school system to utilise that skill. But I believe strongly that actually we should support qualifications for teachers. And if that means we bring people in from industry or from the army or elsewhere, they can come in, but they should qualify. And let's listen to the examples of what's happened recently. The Al Medina School in Derby had unqualified teachers. Kids with special needs were not being attended to. In Pimlico, a 27-year-old was put in charge of that school with no qualification for teaching, no management experience, and walked. And this is what is going on with this free school policy. And I'm afraid to say, Tim, that when Labour put forward some restrictions on the legislation around the use of unqualified teachers, I don't know what you did, but Nick Clegg didn't support Labour on that. And now, once again, we've seen when the going gets tough, he walks and tries to cover himself right. in glory. Uh, uh, thank you. I'm going to take just a couple more points. The, the woman in yellow there. Um, as a teacher myself, I'm absolutely disgusted that it's acceptable for people not to be trained. It is a profession. Yeah. Mm, you yeah. know, other professions aren't treated like that. Okay. Well, let, let's hope this yeah. is good. Go on. Other professions, you were saying? Other professions are treated with a lot more respect mm. than teachers. And it's, you know, it seems to be have a go at teachers all the time. Exactly. Anyone can teach. That's what people think. And, and you think... It's a very, very difficult you job. You can't teach until you've yeah. been taught You need to, to be trained how to teach. All right. And, and you're waving your hand there rather aggressively. Um, I just want to say, I have yes. a PhD and I'm incredibly passionate about my subject, but I still think that I should be qualified. Yeah. And, exactly. it, and it, brings, yeah, it brings the whole reputation yeah. of the, the job into, you know, into question yeah. if we can't make sure that people have, have you know, minimum doctor. qualifications. What, what's your PhD in? In classics. And I'm really passionate. People should study Greek and Latin. And, and, yeah. and, and, <laughs> and do you teach it? I, yeah, I do. And I go into schools and I still don't think that I'm so brilliant that I can then just teach. I yeah. go into schools and I volunteer, but I would still do a PGC mm. if I actually became a teacher. Right. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. 
We have to... We have to keep moving. Will Charlton, please. Question from Will Charlton. As politicians and political commentators, would you say it's, uh, what would you say to those who may feel disillusioned with the current political system? And, and you know well, I mean, anybody watching this programme and listening to the audiences know that uh, there is a great disillusion with everybody involved in politics. So as politicians and political commentators, what would you say to people who feel disillusioned? Um, Owen Jones, you kick off. I'm very passionate about this. I think there's a huge disconnect with politics and ordinary people in this country. I think that's partly because politics has increasingly been treated not as a duty, not as a service, but as a profession, where you increasingly get politicians who've never had a job outside the Westminster bubble, where you get a situation where, if you look at the background of MPs, they're increasingly not drawn from a working-class background. Actually, Caroline's actually an exception, really, if you look at MPs, because to over two-thirds of MPs are now from professional middle-class background. I think this has a consequence because it means MPs can't relate to people and their everyday issues. I'll give you one example and I don't often quote Hazel Blaze, I'll be honest with you, <laughs> but I interviewed Hazel Blaze before the last election. I said, Hazel, five million people stuck on social housing waiting lists in this country. Why didn't Labour do anything about it? She said, to her credit, very candidly, we just weren't, there just wasn't anyone in, in government who was interested in housing. But if you had people who'd been stuck in a social housing waiting list, or someone in their community, or in their family, and you got those people into Parliament, those issues would be far more but how likely do you get to be them in, How do you get them into Parliament? Well, traditionally, the route was trade unions and local government, because what they did is they trained up working-class people, they gave them a political education, and those routes have been attacked. But as well as that, I beg people, and I really want to emphasise this point, politics is not just the soap opera at the top. It's not about Parliament. When we look at all the things we won throughout history, whether it be women's rights, LGBT rights, workers' rights, it wasn't won because of the goodwill and generosity of those above. It's because ordinary people, our ancestors, our mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers, they got out there, often faceless, airbrushed out of history, ignored, they got out there and they fought and they made their voice heard. And we stand as a country on the shoulders of giants. We owe all of our gains, all of our rights to those people. So don't just let politicians be the one, if you like, who pass all these laws. Okay. We just passively stop. Get out there, be organised and make your voice heard. That yeah. is a proud tradition in this country. So you're going to stand for Parliament then? No, I'm not going to stand for Parliament. And I actually want people... <laughs> I'm not going to take I want your people own outside the Westminster right. bubble. I want actual it's... people like people here to stand and put themselves forward. All and right. I think there are careerists for doing so, they're not. P Peter Hitchens, those who feel disillusioned with the current political system, obviously. Are right to do so. Uh, they have been systematically betrayed. And I see no end to it. Uh, the, there are so many issues uh, which have been visited on this country by an elite of self-selecting, closed-minded people, as well represented here this evening, and actually largely incompetent as well, uh, which have done enormous damage to our way of life. So, for instance, who now has anything to say about the deindustrialization of this country and the destruction of manufacturing jobs under the Thatcher government? Uh, who can reverse it? Who can do anything about it? Who will say anything uh, on this panel about the catastrophe of, of mass immigration, which has changed this country irrevocably into somewhere completely different oh, from what goodness. it was. They won't talk about it. They won't talk seriously about the immense problems of crime and disorder, which affect millions of people in their homes and leave them utterly vulnerable to all kinds of unpleasantness and, 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 and violence and menace, which they never used to have time to go. And, uh, and, and there is no sense whatsoever that there will be any reform of the criminal justice system or any attempt to put it right again. These are just some of the subjects but why do you, which, why which do you on which this elite <laughs> just constantly, constantly refuse to why? discuss. Why? Why? Because they themselves have an ideology. They themselves have, have, a, have the ideology of, of, of metropolitan bourgeois bohemians. They despise most people outside. What are you, man of the people? They despise... They despise them. <laughs> well, I mean, you're no, the only person no, on, this, no, on this panel I'm, no, who is... I'm no is more a man of the people than you are, Mr. I don't, I don't you claim to be, but you you're, you're making Jones, a picture I'm, on I'm, here. I'm, so, I'm, I'm simply saying these are the things which they will not do anything about, which they will not do, because they themselves benefit. They themselves benefit from many of the things which, which, which do immense damage. They've benefited from globalisation. 
They've benefited from mass immigration. We talk about mass immigration. Let's talk about immigrants they're, they're coming not, over here, not, propping not, up our NHS, treating us when we're They're not affected. They're not affected. Their, ch their, children, their children don't go to bog standard comprehensives. They're, they're, they're not affected. You know they're not affected by. They're not affected. They're not affected by crime. Yes, I do know how to do it because I know what they do all the time. They will not discuss these things. They will not do anything about them. They ignore what you say. And you think that at general election time you can do something about it? No. The people who stand before you at uh, general election time for, for, the, for the political parties are people who've been pre-selected. You have no control. If I stood for Parliament, or if he stood for Parliament, from, from, our, from our positions, which are quite popular, the fact is the party machines would erase us. The immense amounts of money they're capable of spending, the enormous access they have to the broadcasting organisations, which we don't have most of the time, would well, we make it impossible. Right. Make it impossible. You've got more access than I have, it, Peter. It, uh, would make it impossible, on the All contrary, right. would make it impossible right. for, for <laughs> anyone <laughs> outside the Peter, 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 sorry, to what break would, in. the question was, what would you say to people who feel like you clearly do well, about I've just the said, political association? Just said it. Well, no, wait a moment, wait a moment. <laughs> what would you say to them about how to change things? Are you going to stand as an MP? I'm sorry. Are you going to stand as an MP? No, because uh, for the reasons I've just explained, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the faintest chance. Right. No, my, my advice to anybody young enough to do so is to emigrate before it's too late. Oh, for goodness oh, sake. I mean, this oh, is yeah. just... For yeah. goodness yeah. sake. This yeah. is just... The paper that they've written, you heard it here. This is a ridiculous council of despair. Yeah. I think our country's best days are ahead of us, not behind us. And I think Peter Hitchens yeah. needs to get with the programme. I got involved in politics, actually, through my mum who was a member of the CND and used to take me on CND marches. Oh, wow. And I thought this is interesting, exciting. It was the 1980s. There was a big debate about ideas. And I think that, you know, if you want to be involved in politics, you can be involved in politics. And I want more people to be involved in politics. I think we should make Parliament more open, uh, more easier to access, uh, more, more friendly to people from different backgrounds. I think it is becoming quite an elite of a particular type of professional. I think that's a problem. Yeah. I think we, th we need to think about the way it operates, the terms and conditions, all those kind of things. I'm excited by the primaries that we've done in the Conservative Party to get a wider group of people involved in politics. We need up, to revive yeah. local... Up, no, we've got some new ones coming up, oh, actually, yeah. David. Right. Maybe question time might be involved. No, but what, what we need to do is we need to open up politics, we need to make local government count right. through localism so that people are involved. But this idea that everything is always awful, that's one of the reasons why people turn off politics, because they just hear this constant right. moaning. The Daily Mail, the Daily Mail might call you the man who hates Britain, after yeah. what yeah. you just said. Exactly, uh, any, yes. any, any, anybody, Ed the Ed Miliband of our day. You're not free to call me. I mean, the, it's, it's, it's not, not the, it's not, the it's Rafe not, Miliband. It's not Britain I hate, Britain I love, every field and hedgerow. It's the, it's the people who run it. Or the people who live and, and, here. And, 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 yeah. and, and who are wrecking it. And, All right. and, and, and so, uh, like anybody who cares about his country, I'm, I'm Let, distressed by it. I, I see no life. hope from these interchangeable people. She was right. a Liberal Democrat. For all I know, she still is. Let's hear from her. You're a trust I know I, I was, but I'm not, I'm not saying anymore. Right. You the are person, a Liberal Democrat. The person in the second row there. <laughs> you, sir. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm 19, and so I haven't had the chance to vote yet. I missed the last general election, and unfortunately missed the Welsh referendum as well. And I guess... Going back to the disenchantment point, I guess I hate to use the argument that they're all the same or that they're all liars, but I feel as though, coming from a Labour background myself, I feel as though there is really no difference in itself. They've become, I'd hate to say it, but a centre-right party. I wish there was a new party on the left, but I feel as though there would, there would, they would never stand a chance with this private party of three big groups. All right. And no, I uh, wish someone would address that. Okay. And the person behind you in the yellow shirt, and then I come to you over here on the right. Yeah, yes. Uh, one point of view is that the trade unions represent the common people, the common man. Wouldn't it be a good idea if the trade unions put forward their elected people I to represent the common people? That's point. what they're accused yeah. of doing. But I don't know. The man on the right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You yes. said no yes. Yes. to your on the man on your left. Yes. Uh, yep. One of the ways in which we measure political disillusion is by analysing voter turnout at elections. Mm. This has been uh, very low in recent times. Yes. Mm. Perhaps we could do something practical about it by having elections on Sundays instead of Thursdays, as they do in some other European countries. I'm not sure countries. that would change the view of politicians, would it? Pe people don't, people, more people don't vote. No, hang on. Pe Tim, people people no. don't vote because I, they don't like what's being Tim, offered to them. Tim, you'll go. We've got a lot of minutes. Tim Farron. I, I mean, just, just before I answer the question, We've just got to get away from this nonsense that is peddled by Peter and people like him, that immigration is some kind of curse in this country. It is a blessing. It is... <laughs>
and, see? And, 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 and if you sort of look at the hard fact, it is worth £7 billion a year to our economy, never mind anything else. But are people disillusioned with politics, and they should they be? I mean, I, 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 people are disillusioned with it, and I, I'm often myself sometimes, if I'm honest with you. I joined the Liberals when I was 16, I joined Shelter first, I watched Cathy come home, and it made me cry. That's how I got involved in politics, because something got me in my gut. People do vote, but they don't join political parties anymore. And I, I saw around me in the 1980s, a bit further north than here, half the parents of the kids in my class, including sometimes uh, my own, out of work and out of hope and despairing and the waste of those lives. And I thought, well, I can either sit back and let that happen, or I can get involved and I can try and do something about it. And I, didn't, I joined the Liberals not as a career move. I'd have been a bit flipping stupid if I had. It was not a, exactly a glittering route to a uh, future. Yeah. In we're, politics. we're talking but about what, people's what, view of what, you, not what, your view of what yourself. I, what I'm saying is, what I've heard a lot I, about you. All but I'm what saying, about people's view all of I'm you. saying is, for everybody else, don't get involved in politics because you want to become a member of parliament. Right. That's not why I got involved right. in it. I just thought the world is a grim place, or it's grimmer than it could be, and we can make a difference. And you'll make certain that people like Peter are proved right. Okay. If you Thank don't you, get involved in politics. Thank you. You're part uh, of the problem because the Liberal Democrats inspired, to their credit, hundreds of thousands of people for the last election, and then they betrayed. Trade them on every yeah. single place. Right. The and those people will never trust a politician ever again oh. because of what you did. No, no, no. It undermined him on that. Well, not peace, but silence. Right, I... Silence. Caroline Flint. I think there's lots of uh, examples where we have let ourselves down as politicians. And you therefore can't blame people for being cynical uh, about what they've seen. But, you know, when I joined the Labour Party at FE College, it was because there was a Labour club at the Further Education College. I'd never met an MP in my life, and I joined because I wanted to change things. I looked at my own family, and I felt as passionately then as I do now that your chance in life should be determined by the family you come from and the wealth that you have. Everybody has a chance to succeed, and that's why I joined the Labour Party. But I also accept, after many years now in politics, that we shouldn't become complacent about how we operate. And for me, one of the most enjoyable parts of being a Member of Parliament is living in Doncaster and going down on the train to the House of Commons on a Monday, coming back on a Thursday night and being where my constituents are and doing the best I can for them. Yeah, for, me, right. for me, that is about yeah. the connection. You said about the political yeah. system. We have a system here where, because of the constituency link, you can actually see what the laws in Westminster do to the lives of people in our So, if everybody was like you, important. if everyone was like you, I nobody, nobody would be disillusioned. That, no, I'm not That's saying that. Saying. I think it's a positive part of what right. MPs do, and, uh, and long should that continue. Everybody would be disillusioned with question time. He's got so many hands up, and I've been told I've got to stop. Very quickly, you have to be very, very quick. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that I am one of the thousands that is very disillusioned. Um, I've always voted Liberal. Exactly, Owen. I did feel completely betrayed after the last election. Um, I did selfishly want to live through a coalition, but I had hoped it would be with Labour, not with the Tory party. Um, I don't know where I would vote exactly now. All I know is I wouldn't vote for the Tories with the wreck that you are making of our education right. system. Well, yeah. Anyway, that's, that's dishing it out all round. Our time's up, I'm afraid. Um, next week, we're going to be in St Austell, in Cornwall. The week after that, we're in Boston, in Lincolnshire. And to take part, put questions to the panel, usual stuff, apply via our website there. There's the address, uh, which is the best way to do it, frankly. You can telephone 0330-123-9988. But the website just is probably the best way, and there's a form to fill in. If you're on uh, BBC Radio 5 Live listening to this, uh, the debate goes on, on Question Time, Extra Time, with Steve Nolan and John Pienaar, but for us here on television, it comes to an end. My thanks to our panel, to our audience here in Liverpool. Thank you all very much for coming. Until next Thursday in St Austell from Question Time, good night. <laughs>so as david said don't forget question time extra time now with the chance to continue the debate on bbc radio 5 live here on bbc one next andrew neil with this week